Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Florida Native Plant Society Lunch and Learn. If you're not a member of the Florida Native Plant Society, I encourage you to join. Our organization is run by members. We have 33 chapters, and your membership and your participation in your chapter is really important. Don't know if you have a chapter near you? Check out fnps.org forward slash chapters to see a nice web map to check to see. So uh, this week's Lunch and Learn is with Dr. Patty Anderson, a botanist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Plant Industry. She's going to be presenting on how the state of Florida deals with the plants that are listed, threatened, or endangered by the state. And then next week's Lunch and Learn is again another public public event with with Dr. Patty Anderson, some like it hot, hot spots of endangered plant species in Florida. So today we're going to talk about what the endangered species are and how they're protected. And then uh, next week we're going to be talking about you know where you can find these plants and view them in the wild. So without further ado, here is Dr. Patty Anderson. Hello. It's nice to, to be with all of you. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk with you about uh, in our native flora in Florida. Uh, as Valerie said, I work for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services in the Division of Plant Industry. And a part of our mission is to protect Florida's native and commercially produced plants. So today I'll have the opportunity to talk with you a bit about how we protect the endangered and threatened and commercially exploited species of Florida. So we get a lot of questions about endangered plants and over the years, I've collected a few of them that we hear pretty often. Some of these are related to bureaucratic things and paperwork. So I'll just put in some beautiful plant pictures to keep you entertained while I talk about some forms. Um, and we'll just talk a, a little bit about the plants later on. And next week, we'll focus more on the species. So to get to some of the questions, one of the most consistently asked questions is basically why aren't plants as well protected as animals? Uh, often people will say they're constructing something, uh, paving over a field where I know they're endangered species or they keep mowing the edge of the road where some threatened plants are growing. And we know that spotted owls stopped some wood cutting in in Oregon. So what's up with the difference in plants and animals? Well, it has a lot to do with historical traditions. It started with English common law, uh, then the way the Federal Endangered Species Act was written, and it comes to Florida's own state statutes protecting the plants. So to go way back in our way back machine, uh, when uh, animals were migrating, moving around throughout England, uh, there were disputes about who owned these animals because they could go from place to place. Uh, birds could fly from one farm to another. So the king and his generosity decided he would own all the plants that moved around. And he would decide how they could be harvested. Um, and it didn't matter if it was public land or private land, he would decide what could happen to migrating animals. Um, on the other hand, plants kind of stay where they start. Uh, so they're considered part of the land. They come from the dirt, they stay there. So again, in his generosity, the king said, well, if it's growing on your property, you can decide what to do with it. Of course, there could be some taxes for growing plants, but that's an, a bigger story. So when the United States in 1973 initiated the Endangered Species Act, they treated plants and animals differently as well. 
part of the language of that law is that endangered animal species can't be taken. And taken means killed, harmed, or injured in some way to affect their behavior. For example, limiting their ability to reproduce or eat. So some of their habitat can be protected as well. For plants, the rule is you can't take them off federal land if they're growing there. So that's a little bit different from how animals are treated. And that distinction follows in the foundation of Florida's laws. We have statutes. Um, and in our statutes, statutes, we have chapter 581 that protects our flora and describes what the state's obligations are. To enforce that statute, we have rules, uh, rule 5B40 of the Florida Administrative Code is the implementation of the protection of Florida's native flora. And we at DPI, the Division of Plant Industry, enforce the requirements of that rule. So if you wanna read anything about Florida's protection of plant species, you can look at Rule 5B40, and it will be laid out before you. Um, the purpose for, of the state's protection uh, is described in that rule. And to give you a brief rundown of that, uh, it's the law's purpose is to, has three, the law has three purposes uh, to protect plants from unlawful harvesting, uh, to delineate a procedure for restricted harvesting, and they also decided to encourage propagation, thinking that more plants would be beneficial for our listed species. So we'll go through the purposes one by one. Uh, the way plants are identified in order they, that they can be protected uh, is by defining them as endangered, threatened, and the category ex commercially exploited, which is not as familiar to many people. So you might have heard of plants talked about as rare. And within the Florida statute, there's no definition of rare plants. Uh, so it's just a plant that's not very common. You might use it in, in that way. Um, endangered plants are defined within the state of Florida as species native to the state that are in imminent danger of extinction. And unless things change, they're not likely to survive. So that means within the state of Florida. However, plants that are native here in small numbers might also be native to other larger geographical areas. So some plants might be common in the north and rare in the panhandle, rare in South Florida, but common in the Caribbean. We're protecting Florida's plants. So this includes all the spe species that grow in Florida, they're native to Florida, that are listed by the federal government. So we have many species that are listed both by the state and the federal government, USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. Then to go on to threatened plants, these are plants that are in decline within Florida, but not to such an extent as endangered plants. You can think of this as a list of species we need to watch out for. Then this a uh, group called commercially exploited plants. These are native plants that have been collected from the wild and sold directly. So they might be super abundant. If you think of the Kunti, um, there are plenty of them. But imagine harvesting them by the ton, uh, as they were in South Florida in the early days of the state, because the uh, underground rhizome, the, the storage stem can be harvested and refined into a, a flower-like starch. And there was a big market for that. And suddenly, it 
within a few years, there weren't many of those zamias left in the wild. So that's an example of commercial exploitation. So another question we get is how do plants get defined and put on these lists? Um, for us, the answer is uh, through the generous work of the Endangered Plant Advisory Council. This council meets annually and they review the species that have been listed and they review applications for changes to the list. This group is uh, defined in our rule. Uh, it consists of seven people. Uh, you may have heard of some of these groups, some might be less familiar, but all these are people are volunteering their time uh, to participate in the protection of Florida's plant species. Uh, there's the Federation of Garden Clubs, FNGLA, uh, the Committee for Rare and Endangered Plants and Animals, which is probably our most obscure group, but they have a good heart. The Florida Forestry Association and could be your favorite, the Florida Native Plant Society. In addition to representatives elected by each of these groups, there are two botanists from state universities. And by tradition, there's one from North Florida and one from South Florida. Patty, may I interrupt you? Yes. You're green. I'm green. Well, I, I've been trying to produce chlorophyll my whole <laughs> life, so maybe it's working. It's Let working. me try. Okay, I'm not sure that you can still see me. I cannot still see you. So, um, the fix was worth, the cure was worse, worse than the disease. Well, let's see. Um, maybe if you can hear me, that'll be good enough okay. for right now. For right now. I think we're back where we were. Um, so the uh, Endangered Plant Advisory Council depends on a system that helps them have a quantitative measure of the relative threat to species that come before them. Uh, and the system is based on a form that uh, anyone can find on the internet Probably the easiest way is just Google FDAX-08422. I did that the other day and it came right up. Um, this form can be used to nominate species that are not on the list, uh, to give information about plants already on the list. And if there's some new information, maybe you are working um, on a research project or a conservation project or you've been reading and find some obscure journal with some information about one of our rare plants that you think uh, the council should be aware of, you can use this form to send them the information. And these are the categories we use to determine uh, the endangerment, the degree of threat to any species. So we look at the number of populations throughout the state, and their categories for each uh, range of occurrences, uh, how many individuals in total, uh, how many counties are the, this species found in. So plants with a very limited range might be more threatened than those that are more widespread or able to survive in more uh, diverse habitats. Protection means are they found on protected sites, uh, say federal forests, state forests, state parks, some other kind of protected land in a conservation status. If they're only found along the roadside um, or growing in a private person's homestead, then they're not protected nearly as well. Then the degree of threat, um, 
this is probably the most qualitative determinant. Um, plants that are at the edge of development, plants that have limited habitat, and that habitat is appealing for some other purpose. Um, you can imagine all the threats that there could be uh, for Florida plant species. And these numbers are added and the sum uh, is the total score. Less than nine is endangered, nine to 12 would be threatened and beyond 12, the plant would not be listed. And the special circumstance, special consideration, um, those are kind of undefined in general, but plants that are endemic to Florida, they grow here and nowhere else are assigned a negative one. So that reduces the score of any plants if, if it's found in Florida only. There could be other unusual circumstances like the plant has a single pollinator and that pollinator is endangered. That seems like worth a minus one to me. So we get information or the Endangered uh, Plant Advisory Council gets information from a number of sources. Um, the natural areas inventory, uh, the Florida Native Plant Society often helps with information. Then university faculty, other groups doing research, individuals who have um, special love for a particular species might provide information. And there are lots of volunteers who will go on plant surveys and help collect the data that's then given to us by one of the other groups. Uh, that information is compiled and presented at annual meetings. Uh, and those meetings are open to the public. We have uh, information in the sunshine for our plants. And if you are an interested party and want to know the uh, date of the meeting and the agenda, you can contact Jason Stanley. Uh, his email address is on the screen now. Um, to go back to the purposes of the law, restricted harvesting is one of the concerns the state has for protecting our plants. We know that some, there are some good reasons for collecting plants or parts of the plants, for example, the seeds. And if you have a good reason to collect some of our endangered or, or uh, commercially exploited plants, there's a form for that, FDAX 08025. So we get the question, do I need a permit? When do I need a permit? So, to harvest plants regulate it, uh, legally, um, if they're endangered or commercially exploited, and they're growing on your own property, even on your own property. If you want to sell those plants, you need a permit for us from, from FDAX, the 082025. If you're not selling the plants, if they're just growing there, uh, maybe you want to collect some seeds and give them to your neighbor, you don't have to have a permit. If the plants are growing on someone else's land or public land, you need the permission of the owner. You cannot trespass even if you have a permit from the state for collecting. So first get permission of the owner in writing and Conveniently, our state form has a page for you to record the signature, so you'll have all the paperwork together. If you're collecting even one part of an endangered species, that means a, one plant or one seed, you need the permit for collecting. If you're collecting three or more plants or parts of plants of commercially exploited plants, you need our permit. You might have heard of the Saranoa Repen saw palmetto berry collecting uh, industry that's developed in Florida. All those collectors have to fill out the form and get this permit so that we know they are uh, collecting from a place where they have permission. 
And surprising to some people, there's no permit required for collecting any number of threatened plants. Remember, threatened species are on a watch list. We want to know what happens to them, but they're not in the kind of danger we would find for endangered plants yet. So where can you find this permit to collect? Well, you can look on our website, uh, forms.freshfromflorida.com slash 08025.pdf or search for native plant harvesting permit in Florida. The, uh, the bullet about saw palmetto harvesting has some good examples that you can use no matter what you're collecting. So if you want to rescue plants, you still need a permit from us so that we can have confidence that they're going to survive the transition and the replanting. Um, there was a wonderful Florida Native Plant Society Lunch and Learn on June 11, and there's the link you can see. It went into great detail about exactly what you need to do, and it was done so well, I would just say go to that YouTube recording and you'll have everything you need to know. If you have questions after that, you can still call me. So in the form, the application, if you decide you're going to rescue plants, you need to give us a brief description of who's going to do the rescue. Uh, if it's a group of volunteers, do they have a leader who has some expertise or is there a reason to think they can collect the plants without destroying them? Uh, how they'll be prepared for transportation, where they're going to be moved and why that new place should be suitable. Again, these can be described briefly. And if you have questions, you can call Division of Plant Industry and we can help you figure it out. Uh, it's also important to remember that when you have very little time to rescue the plants, we want to work with you. So if you see the bulldozers at the end of the block and the plants are on the opposite end and you have little time, uh, call us and we'll somehow manage uh, to make sure everything is going according to the rules. So we'll, we will talk you through it or um, hopefully you have more time than that. You can expect that we would respond within a week for a normal rescue or request for a research project. So the last part of the law is to encourage propagation. So plant nurseries can apply to collect endangered plants, their seeds, uh, or the commercially exploited species as well. Now, since they're commercially exploited, that's a clue that they're especially uh, useful in the nursery industry. So uh, many of the nurseries are applying for commercially exploited plants. We review the application and if it's approved, nurseries can propagate and sell the plants they produce. So the idea is that they propagate for sale. They don't sell directly from uh, the collections they make. And another question we get is, does anybody really enforce these rules? I mean, who's gonna know? You're out there in Florida. Well, one of the most heartwarming stories I've ever heard and participated in was a story of some pitcher plants that a family had picked up. They were out riding on an all-wheel, all-terrain vehicle. Uh, they had kids without helmets and that caught the attention of a sheriff. The law enforcement officer knew that pitcher plants were endangered. And so he collected them from the, the family, 
sent them in for identification from me. And it was evidence in this case. Now I still have this evidence because he didn't say what to do with it. And it's evidence. I can't destroy it. So um, I can prove that law enforcement does its job with regard to endangered plants. Uh, it turned out the family was just unaware of the status of the plants. They weren't trying to sell them. There was follow-up to find that they didn't have a secret plant nursery. Um, but I, I took heart that our law enforcement can pay attention to plants as well as all the other things that they have to do. Um, you're probably familiar with the white top pitcher plant uh, if you live in North Florida. It's one of our beautiful carnivorous plants and they suffer because of threats from habitat loss, uh, wetlands get drained, buildings get built, and they're so appealing. They're um, a target of collectors who might try to collect them illegally. Uh, and if you think back to our ranking form, their total score was seven and uh, if it's less than nine, the plant is listed as endangered. So another question I get is where can I find the most recent list? I want to know what's endangered, threatened, and commercially exploited in Florida. Well, on our website, we have uh, a downloadable copy. You can go to this website that's listed. You can search for the title, Endangered, Threatened, and Commercially Exploited Plants of Florida. Um, and if you have trouble with that, contact our helpline and we'll be happy to walk you through it. The plants are also listed in the rule 5B40 that I mentioned at the beginning. You can search for Florida's statutes and administrative rules uh, and you'll see the most current listing. Although our Endangered Plant Advisory Council meets regularly every year, it sometimes takes um, more than a few months to get their decisions translated into the rules. So uh, if you're following a particular species, you might want to check up more than once to see that it, if it was recommended for listing, that it has been listed. Another question is what species are most endangered? Which ones are worst off? And this is a question that's actually hard to answer because we don't know the immediate status of any plant and we don't know the plans of people who are likely to pave over some of our endangered species on their own property. So uh, here are some examples from our rating scales, which gives you an idea. Uh, this one, Pleopeltis astrolepis, was collected in 1977. It was seen again in 1986, and it's possibly disappeared from Florida. It was only seen in Broward County. The plant is common in the Caribbean and in Central America, but Florida wants to protect its own native plants in Florida. Uh, this one is kept on the list, even though it's likely not to have survived just in case it's found again. And that does happen. Um, so here's a list of some of the other plants that are that have very low scores on our rating scale. And as you look through it, you'll see there's some orchids, uh, ferns, a variety of kinds of plants that have become quite scarce in Florida. Some of these is because we had few of them to begin with, and we'll talk about uh, the distribution of endangered plants a little more next week. And I said some plants were thought to be lost and seen again. Here's an example of that, the Cranicus musicosa, uh, the cypress knee helmet orchid. It was collected in 1905. And for some mysterious reason, it was not collected again. 
And as far as we know, no one saw it. But then in Fakahatchee Strand, a healthy population was discovered in 2004 by park rangers. So you just never know what's lurking in the swamp. Now it's possible uh, that population grew and thrived and it was just in such an obscure place that it was not seen by anyone who might collect it or make an herbarium specimen. Another uh, example of a very rare plant, a, a very endangered plant is uh, Harperocallus flava, Harper's beauty. Uh, this is one of the most endangered in Florida. It's listed by the federal government as endangered. It's found only in three counties, only in Florida, so there's not a, a big population somewhere else. Uh, the ranking score is 3.5, so not quite the most endangered, but it's in a tough spot. Fewer than a thousand individuals the last time it was counted. Um, and it's a beautiful plant, it has six bright yellow tepals. The leaves are like an iris leaves. They flattened and, and connected together at the base. And I mentioned the family Liliaceae. It, some people will recognize it as being in the lily family. Um, recent molecular information has told us it's in a different family, the Tofeldiaceae, which is tougher to remember, but more accurate. It's still, you'll see it listed either way. And I mention that also because it's a reminder to me to tell you that um, when plants are listed, whatever the species name at that time is, is usually how they continue to be listed on the state uh, regulated plant index. We don't change the names very often because there's concern that every name of every species is a hypothesis it might change again in the near future. And you can always find the current name uh, because we keep track of changes in plant names. We call them synonyms. And so if you know an older name, you can find the newer name. Uh, of course, if you have the newer name and you look at our list, you might say, I thought this was endangered, but I don't see it on the list. Just check for uh, synonyms and you're likely to find the plant you're looking for. Another question, sadly, that comes up is, can these state lists really help? Well, there are some reasons to think that they do help conserve the plants. Uh, we have a way of identifying species that are endangered or threatened or exploited. Um, it's based on their rankings, and so we can determine differences among endangered plants. Um, and we have a mechanism for observing changes in plant populations because each species is reviewed once every four years. So that's one of the tasks of the Endangered Plant Advisory Council when they meet each year. So if you have other questions, if you uh, want more information, uh, you can contact me or the DPI helpline. And I'm going to try to join you again in person. And I will stop sharing my screen unless I need to leave the name, the contact information on screen. I'll leave it up. I can put your uh, email, <clears throat> I can put your email address on the in the chat if you like and then you can. Okay, them. I'll leave it up for just a moment because I want to give you the theme song for protecting endangered plants at DPI. It's uh, based on a Roots music song. I think Roots music is perfect for botany. You might call it Americana. I want to save endangered
But everybody's been making a shout so big and loud and drowning me out. I want to save endangered plants. I want to help them one and all. Don't really need another shopping mall. But everybody's been making a shout so big and loud been drowning me out. I want to save endangered plants. I want to help them one and all. Don't want to see another shop, shopping mall. But everybody's been making a shout so big and loud, been drowning me out. I want to save endangered plants. I want to draw a line in the sand. Don't want to see another Disneyland. But everybody's been making a shout so big and loud, been drowning me out. I want to save endangered plants. I want to save endangered plants. So that's my song. A great question from Marion, Ryan, uh, who asked, how do you define a population of plants, specifically when you're talking about those, um, uh, like submitting the forms for, for getting a species listed? Uh, in general, it's a group that's well, that you can uh, define separate from other groups. So uh, in some ways, it depends on the species and the location. So if you have a group of plants on one side of a wide river, even though you might be able to see plants across the river, that's a barrier for many kinds of plants. If it's a population that has seeds that are floating and able to survive in water, that, that wide river might not be a separation. So as a biologist, you have to take a lot, number of considerations into account uh, to define a population. But um, if, in, but theoretically, it's a group of plants of one species separated um, far enough that uh, cross pollination won't occur from another group of plants of the same population of the same species. I think some people gave me some rough radii, like, uh, you know, a quarter mile. Some people said half mile. Um, but in practice, that's going to depend on the species and their their pollination. As we discussed several weeks ago in the Lobelia Lunch and Learn, there's, you know, mechanisms for preventing cross-pollination of different species. So um, something like, you know, how well these species are uh, able to pollinate over different distances. Right. Right. And Marianne, you always have to consider the species you're talking about. Okay, so Marion has a follow-up question. So population doesn't mean a minimum number of plants in one place. No, you could have a population of one individual. That's one reason uh, we look for populations and abundance. How many individuals total as well as how many are occurring in small groups? So it doesn't have to be so a viable have, population yeah. um, to be a population. <laughs> you might have uh, a thousand plants that are all together in one small park. And that's one population in a thousand species. You might have a uh, hundred individuals in 10 different parks spread across 10 counties. And so that gives a different picture of their chances for survival. Okay. Let's see. Wendell Cropper has a very insightful question. Uh, how would revised taxonomy, possibly eliminating the name of a listed species, be dealt with, or a new species split out that is likely endangered due to limited habitat and population size? Well, combining the species usually doesn't change our list because we are very traditional. 
if a species is separated, uh, it could uh, be that there's a new species name with a limited distribution and that newly recognized species could be listed immediately. It could be that there are varieties of a species that are endangered and listed as a variety. For example, uh, there's a Sideroxalon that grows in the Everglades. It's a variety of a species that's abundant across the state. That variety is listed as endangered because there are so few of them and they're well defined. So with the um, the Dicerandras that have been, they were all they were all Dicerandra something, and then they were split out. So now we have Dicerandra modesta. And I think that happened before they were listed. So each of those species is on our list. You know, it's the list has been around since 1978. So there have been a lot of changes, and there are a lot of artifacts of the way things had been done. Um, so, so that's why I mentioned that we're conservative in the names of plants. So you may see some very old names uh, and some changes. We, we do try to recognize that varieties can deserve protection. And so those are, are listed. Okay, so you, the state, will recognize something that's currently a variety but also deserves protection, or merits protection yeah. based on the ranking. Right. Okay. And how does the state, uh, the state lists for threatened and endangered plant species interface with the federal threatened and endangered? Every federally listed endangered or threatened species, plant species that grows in Florida is included in the state's list as endangered. So all the requirements for endangered plants apply to anything that's threatened or endangered on the federal list. So if you want to collect those, you need a state permit. If you're collecting on federal property, you just need the federal permit because you've got to you've got to go through them to collect on federal property. Okay. I mean, we don't, I mean, we have some federal property in Florida, All right? We have the Everglades National Park, and then... Uh, there are the um, sea, the federal seashore and uh, Merritt Island, Christ, um, Cedar Key has a, a federal seashore. Does that include, like, the National Wildlife Refuges? Uh, yes, that was yes. the word I was trying to say, the Wildlife Refuge. Okay. And then uh, some... Uh, federal for I think there are federal forests here as well. National forests. National forests, yeah, national forests. And then bases. So I mean, we have lots of military bases. I think they're included as federal property as well. Okay. Now some people like to get a state permit just because they're crossing. They leave the federal property and they still have the and they have the plants with them. Uh, and so if if someone wants to get a permit from us. Uh, then they can explain their reason and show us that they have the federal permission. We just can't give someone permission to go on federal property. So what about um, if something gets listed in the state level, is there any communication between the state and, and the federal authorities for listing to say, hey, maybe you should look at this as maybe listing this federally? Uh, the issue is that many thing, many plants are endangered within the state of Florida, but abundant other places. So there's no automatic connection, but um, our cohorts, our counterparts uh, in the United States Department of Agriculture um, are very concerned with preserving plant species and uh, they look for critically endangered habitats to protect uh, so they, they're they watching it, even though um, there's nothing automatic that happens. Okay. So if someone, you know, say there was an endemic plant that someone wanted to list, they could list it statewide, uh, but there's not going to be necessarily any action taken immediately by a federal agency. Is, oh, wow, look, we saw that's 
we saw that this endemic plant was listed endangered in Florida, we should do something, probably that person or entity would have to follow through and attempt to get it federally listed. Right. Um, and in fact, you'll see many of our species are endemic, but not necessarily federally listed. So I think it's a bigger barrier to get through the federal listing. Right. Well, I mean, of course, if something is federally listed, then that requires um, the federal government to spend some money to make sure it doesn't go extinct. Yeah. Whereas if you have something that's endangered or, you know, state endangered, right, you, the state of Florida is not necessarily required to spend money to make sure that doesn't go extinct. No. It's a higher barrier to entry there for a reason. Right. <laughs> not necessarily a reason related to whether a species should go extinct or not, but a sort of a governance issue. <laughs> right. Any other questions? I mean, you must have covered things uh, extremely well because those two questions from Marin and Wendell were the only ones in the chat. So people speak now or forever hold your peace. Do you have anything you'd like to specifically say to the native plant and rare plant aficionados that may be watching? Oh, just keep up the good work. Uh, we have a lot of applications for permits from the Native Plant Society to do rescues and other groups around the state. So um, if you're involved in conservation, uh, please continue and accept my thanks for all the work that you do. Thank you. Yeah, we, you know, I participate in plant rescues. I bought a car so that we could, you know, have more truck space to rescue on site and, and rescue more plants. So really appreciate that we can get those permits and save those plants so that we don't lose yeah, that biodiversity. Uh, and I should just say again that uh, if you're trying to rescue plants and have limited time, just let us know so we can work with you and get all the paperwork in place as quickly as possible. Yes, and if you are interested in rescuing, right, of course, Patty's a great resource. We're a great resource. Watch that Lunch and Learn. I just posted, I posted in the chat, the link in the chat a while ago, and, you know, you can find that on our YouTube channel. It's public now. Um, and, yeah, so watch that before you decide to rescue anything. We'd like to help, and Patty would like to help. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I look forward to seeing you next week. Yes, thank you, Patty. I hope everyone has a, a wonderful Friday and a great weekend.